Thank you, Amos. I would like to call upon the discussants, the uh, Ambassador Jean-David Levit, Professor Vitali Nomkin, Professor David Menasri and M.K. Tzachi Hanegbi, please. We have an hour for this panel. Every panelist is going, the panelists are going to speak according to the order that I've mentioned, and they are going to speak for about 10 minutes each, uh, and uh, then we are going to open the floor for Q's and A's, and uh, Amos Yadlin is going to conclude this panel. I will introduce very briefly the four uh, panelists, uh, Ambassador Jean-David Lévy, who was an advisor to two presidents in France, Jacques Chirac and Nicolas Sarkozy, Professor Naumkin is the head of the Russian Institute for Middle Eastern Studies and a member of the Russian Academy for Sciences. Professor David Menashri is the president of the Academic Center for Law and Business, and of course, a Professor Emeritus at the Tel Aviv University. Everybody knows him in Israel, of course. And M.K. Tzachi Hanegbi from the Likud faction, the Likud Israel Beitenu faction. So, Ambassador Levit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to participate uh, in this uh, session. And uh, I'll start by uh, expressing my admiration for the presentation that General Amos Yadlin uh, just made. I agree 100% with what he said. I'd like simply to add one actor to the three he mentioned, that is Iran, Israel, and the United States. The fourth actor, in my view, should be taken into account. The name is the international community. We live in a globalized world for 30 years now uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the opening up of China. And today in this globalized world, it seems that there is no more a pilot in the plane. As it was said, in a way, uh, the US are a bit tied to be the pilot. After two frustrating wars uh, in Iraq and then in Afghanistan, they are getting out. Uh, we know from experience uh, in Libya uh, that the new mood in America uh, is helping from behind. And that is our experience today in Mali, where we have 4,000 troops deployed uh, fighting uh, Al-Qaeda. But at the same time, the other actors don't want to be involved. Uh, the Europeans are deeply involved in their own difficulties uh, with the Euro. And the new emerging giants, uh, China, India, Brazil, well, they want more rights in the international institutions, but no more responsibilities. Uh, with the exception of their own region, where they want to act as a dominant power. Uh, we saw it uh, with Syria, with three vetoes uh, in the Security Council. Now, I think that it is very important that together we build a political order for the 21st century. And I think this is possible precisely about Iran. For more than 10 years, we've been negotiating in the format of the P5 plus one, that is, the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany. I think we are deeply united on the substance, that is, we all agree that we don't want to see Iran with the nuclear device, with the bomb. If we are united in the negotiation, we should go down the road to the end. That is, as Amos said, if at the end of this year it is obvious that Iran wants to get the bomb, 
then the P5 plus one should remain united. Is it mission impossible? I don't think so. Remember the first Gulf War in 1991. President Bush's father succeeded in building a coalition of the willing with the participation of Arab states. I do think that if we were close to the situation that I most described, that is near breakout, then President Obama should speak, should speak with the free Europeans, no difficulties, we all agree. And I think that France and the UK would be ready to participate in military action. For Germany, question mark. But don't exclude it, because Israel is a very, very special case for Germans. So what is left is China and Russia. Well, for the Chinese, the worst scenario is either the situation where you have the bomb and then a very messy situation, uh, acts of uh, uh, terrorism and so on, uh, or the Israeli scenario where you have uh, the Israeli taking uh, action because then you would have uh, a reaction uh, by uh, the uh, international, uh, the, the uh, Muslim community uh, supporting the Iranian uh, leadership uh, and the Iranian leadership would be reinforced uh, and then you would have proliferation in the whole uh, Middle East uh, uh, with Saudi Arabia uh, buying uh, weapons in Pakistan with uh, Turkey uh, and Egypt uh, following. Uh, all this is a nightmare scenario. Uh, and so the only option left is a military action by the US because only the US has the capacity to really destroy the nuclear capabilities uh, of uh, Iran. But we, we see and we understand that President Obama has a kind of split mind about this question. On one hand, he uh, is concluding two frustrating wars. So to take action, military action, even if it's not a war, I agree with you, Amos, uh, but strikes, uh, surgical strikes, well, it's nonetheless a very risky move. But at the same time, and that's the other side of the equation, his legacy, well, if his legacy is a nuclear Iran with proliferation in the whole Middle East and the end of the non-proliferation treaty, that is not really a, a, a good legacy. And so my view is that to get out of this bad equation, uh, President Obama should do his best to convince the Chinese and the Russians to participate uh, in a military threat, not action, but the threat of military action. The Chinese have a genuine, genuine interest in that. Why? Uh, because if you have a messy scenario, it means that oil price will go up to $200 or so. Uh, it means that almost rates could be closed. It's a disaster for a country which is importing its oil, 70% of its oil from the almost threat and so on. Uh, then you have Russia. Of course, you may say, and uh, I'm speaking under the control of Vitaly here, uh, it's good for Russia to have oil at $200. Yes, but it's very bad to have nuclear Iran next door on the other side of the Caspian Sea close to uh, the uh, Muslim population of the Caucasus in Russia. So uh, all this leads me to the conclusion that there is a real possibility to be together, together at the key moment, that is when a last message must be sent to Tehran. If this message is the message coming from a united 
P5 plus one, the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany, to say, look, if you don't sign by the, don't sign by the end of this week, the good deal that is on the table, then together we will take military action, together. And then, if we do so, believe me, the Iranian will think twice before refusing. Because it makes a sea difference, a sea a change, if it is an Israeli action, or even an action by the US alone, or the five permanent members together with Germany threatening to bomb together Iran. And if this threat is articulated by the five plus one, then I think that like Khomeini when he said, I'm swallowing the poison and poisonous uh, 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 pill or, or drink uh, to get peace, well, I think Khamenei will follow the example and uh, there will be no need for military action because they will not resist this threat. Thank you very much.